Within this natural world lie countless hidden worlds. Worlds experienced through sensations, vibrations, and colors that not everyone can detect. Every animal perceives the world in its own way, and survival depends on reading the signs or relaying the signals. In every environment, nature has provided specialists, and among them are the special forces. We begin our discovery of the amazing special forces by inspecting a sleek, limber, and well-equipped fleet. They patrol the waters off the Australian coast. Bottlenose dolphins. These four meter long submariners perform their maneuvers in relatively shallow waters, usually in pods of five to 20. Sometimes these mini fleets embark on hunting operations in river estuaries, but in these murky waters, it's difficult to see and get oriented. Which is why these specialists don't trust their eyes, but strongly rely on their hearing. Dolphins are known for their sophisticated communication techniques. When hunting, they use their vocal and hearing skills to perform echolocation. A dolphin does not have vocal cords. This communication specialist produces sounds by moving air through its nasal passages. Dolphins don't have a language, but they do have a wide vocabulary of whistles, trills, clicks, squeaks, and creaks. Each sound, pattern, and frequency carries a different meaning. Bottlenose dolphins can hear sounds almost as deep as we can, but in a high range, they can hear much better than cats or dogs, well beyond our own ability. In most social communication, they use their lower range, but it's still much higher than we can hear. Each dolphin identifies itself with a signature whistle that lasts less than one second. That whistle is within our hearing range. A mother dolphin can whistle to her calf almost continuously for several days after giving birth. This acoustic imprinting helps the cadet learn to identify his commanding officer, his mother. In about a month, he'll develop his own ID call. Having learned the pod's call signs, the cadet joins some of his crew members on a hunting expedition in the deeper sea. Communication helps the team coordinate their efforts to round up the maximum amount of fish with the least amount of effort. First, they must locate the best fishing spots. That's where echolocation comes in. The dolphins emit an ultrasonic ping underwater, which travels about four and a half times faster than it travels through air. Like sonar, the sound bounces off the prey and echoes back to the dolphin. Echolocation can pinpoint a fish the size of a pack of gum from about 200 meters away. Like most echolocation specialists, 
Dolphins pick up the sound in their lower jawbone. In Florida, bottlenose dolphins may increase their hunting success by venturing into river estuaries where the salt and freshwater mix. Like sailors in a fog, they couldn't navigate the murky water here without echolocation. Communication and teamwork win the day. Three or more dolphins coordinated strikes herd the slippery fish onto the shore where they can't escape. Once they've captured the enemy in the mud, the special forces storm the beach, eat the fish, and get back to the water. Such is the power of the bottlenose dolphin, a communication specialist that uses its skills to rally the troops for its well-coordinated search and destroy missions. From the formidable team players in the seas, we go to another social and highly coordinated specialist. But this one has mastered the sky. The European countryside is one of the summer home bases and training grounds for a daring squadron of tiny pilots. Patrolling the skies and returning to the airfield is a barn swallow. These avian airmen are specialists when it comes to establishing beach heads and new bases. Whole squadrons of these small pilots crisscross thousands of kilometers twice a year in their migration. To navigate on their 11,000 kilometer mission across the equator and back again, they rely on the Earth's magnetic field. They make camp in Europe only during warm months when the insects are plentiful. As their name suggests, barn swallows usually construct their hangars in human buildings. Old barns are an ideal place to hatch the new recruits. Their mother provides for them in the nest for about 20 days, and even when they fledge, they keep returning to this mess hall for about a week. Barn swallows return to the same nest area, sometimes for generations. Like a homing beacon, the magnetic fingerprint of their base is imprinted on them so they know precisely where to go. When autumn comes, the squadron decamps. These European swallows usually migrate to southern Africa. These winter grounds are home to about two million of them. Swallows feed here and wait out the winter. They need to regain their strength for the treacherous return to Europe. But they won't get too comfortable. They're a mobile unit, and once the snow melts in their European air station, they'll need to return and breed. To navigate, barn swallows can observe the Earth's magnetic field lines. They probably see the lines as dark spots. When they head north in spring, they see the magnetic lines above the horizon. 
In autumn, when migrating toward the equator, the lines appear below the horizon. Their compass information changes even when moving east or westward because they're able to perceive the angle or the inclination of the magnetic field. These swallows are called back home from their winter base in Nigeria. They may have to travel around 5,000 kilometers to get there. And between them and home lies one of the planet's biggest death traps, one that cannot be conquered. The 9 million square kilometers Sahara Desert. Too wide to go around, with temperatures reaching a blistering 59 degrees Celsius. These swallows have traveled 2,500 kilometers since they started their journey. They need to refuel to continue, thanks to their built-in compass. They know just where to go. Umama Oasis. The swallows are safe. Now the squadron will be able to continue using their specialist navigation system to safely return to their summer base. Leaving the migrating squadron of sparrows to their aerial maneuvers, we cross an ocean to inspect some heavy forces on land, specialists in clandestine communication. These special forces send messages with the highest level of encryption. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. One of Africa's most recognizable ambassadors lives only in certain parts of the continent, and more rarely in parts of Asia. Built like tanks, but conducting their peaceful mission on the grasses here are the rhinos. These white rhinos form a unit of up to a dozen soldiers. Like all command posts, communication is the key to keeping order. Letting the troops know who is the captain. Training the new cadets. And moving up the chain of command. All six species of rhino encode their messages to utilize their great sense of smell and hearing. These specialists are among the few land animals that can transmit their classified reports in frequencies way below the threshold of human hearing using infrasound. The benefit of infrasound is that the lower frequency sounds travel farther than higher frequency sounds. The infrasound waves aren't as easily disrupted by hills and trees. And that means this male's getting the message he's been waiting for. The usually solitary adults fraternize only when they're on a diplomatic mission to mate. Females leave behind their usual scent to mark their presence. When it's time to reproduce, they use infrasound signaling to advertise their readiness. Rhinos have poor vision, so they show no outward visual signs that they're in heat. 
Once these special forces meet, the female will follow her chosen male, warning off other females by leaving scent marks. <laughs> then the pair follow the usual protocol to conduct their liaison. African rhinos have fulfilled their mission. But the true masters of infrasonic communication are their special forces counterparts stationed in the dense jungles of Asia. There are fewer than 100 Sumatran rhinos, Disumotrus sumatrensis, left in the world. These specialists are the most solitary rhinos, very territorial with vast ranges, about 50 square kilometers for males and 15 for females. So their infrasonic signal has to travel enormous distances through many obstacles. Sumatran rhinos can produce 90 decibel whistles, about as loud as a nearby train whistle, but because the sound is in the infrasonic range, we can't hear it. Even so, the whistle, followed by a sharp burst of air, can carry for almost 20 kilometers across the forest to reach the ears of other rhinos. These two have found each other. The specialized infrasonic signaling has worked. Now they debrief each other, agree to the terms of their treaty, and complete their crucial mission. About a year later, the strategic alliance of these soldiers pays off. In the night, the mother gives birth to her calf. It's a momentous occasion. Sumatran rhinos have a single baby only every two to five years. Despite their great sensory equipment for romantic reconnaissance, Sumatran rhinos are dying out for lack of reproduction. The new recruit will stay in boot camp with her mother for more than two years, and it will take even longer before she joins the special forces, using her infrasonic abilities to become a parent herself. Sumatran rhinos are peaceful herbivores, specialists in long-range communication to locate each other over great distances. Our next specialists are more interested in finding prey, and their method is both very sophisticated and extremely ancient. In the waters near the African coast, along the sandy bottom, lives a special forces tracker skilled in locking onto his target. Hiding and waiting like a sniper, the stingray. With eyes on the top of her head and no way to see below, how does she hunt? Her eyes aren't important when she's equipped with specialized sensors called ampullae of Lorenzini that can detect the minute electrical charges of her potential prey. She shares this skill with her relative, the shark. They've developed this specialized sensory apparatus about 15 million years ago. And this one is about to begin her feeding mission. These small squids would make a perfect meal. But the ray is into something else, something easier to catch. Their eggs.
like a minesweeper. All she has to do is brush the surface. And there they are. She zeroes in on the tiny electrical impulses they, like all living things, emit. The underside of a stingray's body is pocked with hundreds of thousands of tiny pores, called ampullae of Lorenzini. They connect to a long, jelly-filled canal which contains a bundle of sensory cells. The ampullae allow rays to detect weak electrical fields emitted by muscle movements of their prey, even if they're hidden. The ampullae can also detect motion. The ray doesn't care if it stirs up the sand because it doesn't use its eyes to hunt. In the waters off Australia, a stingray has perfectly timed his raid on a busy outpost. Spider crabs are usually solitary, except when it's time to molt their shells. Vulnerable, they gather in huge numbers, which makes them an easy target. Though the ray has superior weaponry, he needs a strategy. He looks for the freshest molts with the softest armor. For this specialist, guided by electricity, that's no problem. The new soft shell releases slightly stronger electrical impulses. For the crab, there's nowhere to hide. sweeps the bottom until its receptors lock on for his search and destroy mission. Electro reception is this soldier's secret weapon. Electro reception works great for marines like the stingray, where the water is conductive. But special forces living in one of the driest climates on Earth need to develop different survival tactics. The edge of Africa's Namib Desert is a home to a well trained regiment of trackers that works best when working together. Duties are divided, and the sentries always on guard to protect the compound of meerkats. These small members of the mongoose family bet on numbers. An average clan can have about 20. While a few specialists keep a sharp eye out for predators, the rest busy themselves with foraging duties. Like an air raid siren, a sharp shrill can warn all personnel to take cover and disappear within their complex burrow system. Meerkats are specialists with sharp vision and superb sense of smell. Those are what it takes to survive when you're stationed in a desert or semi-desert environment. Meerkats spend much of their time digging with their noses near the ground. 
They can smell prey hiding below the surface. Their sensitive olfactory equipment can even discern between favorites, familiar foods, and ones they're not familiar with. Victory! This soldier has flushed out a scorpion. The meerkat is immune to its venom, so he could eat it without a second thought. A meerkat clan's territory could span 10 square kilometers, and the troops guard it fiercely against enemy forces, including other meerkats. An invasion team approaches. The meerkats rely on their sense of smell to tell allies from enemies. Once they identify their adversaries, the clan works together to drive them out. Friends and foe alike may be silent or well camouflaged, but they can never hide their scents, which is why the meerkat's special forces rely on their noses. This cobra might think she secretly infiltrated the meerkat's defenses. Not on his watch. He sounds the alert. The military patrol instantly surrounds the invader, ruining the element of surprise she depends on. She aborts her mission. One of the colony's biggest threats comes without a scent and without a sound. So these specialists rely on their sharp vision as an early warning defense against threats from land or air. Dark patches around their eyes serve as natural sunglasses, essential in this sunlit environment. A meerkat sentry can spot danger or prey from as far as one kilometer. Like actual cats, meerkats have forward-facing eyes for depth perception. Horizontal pupils also improve their depth perception and their horizontal field of view. Their large eyes and eye sockets take up more than 20% of their skull length. This specialized vision gives the foraging troops enough time to retreat in case of attack. The special forces are put to the test, retreating to their burrow with no casualties. Staying small and limber and working as a highly trained unit enables these specialists to prevail over their predators. Which is why the meerkats thrive as one of the Namib Desert's special forces. On the other side of the world, in colder terrain, another unit of mighty specialists also demands a high level of coordination and leadership to succeed. In the woods of North America live iconic predators able to take down targets way bigger than themselves. Gray wolves, 
These survival specialists live in packs. An alpha pair of wolves leads each pack. They demand strict social order, which they enforce through constant communication. The pack maintains discipline by barking, growling, and howling, which reduce the need for open conflict. Vocal communication also works at a distance. So wolves are specialists at making sounds and listening. They call any time of day, but they're most active and vocal in the evening. When the wind is still, a wolf can heed a call through the forest from 10 kilometers away or 16 kilometers in the open. As impressive as that might be, a pack of wolves may range over a territory up to 2,500 square kilometers, depending on the availability of their prey. <laughs> And what hearing and body language can't do, scent can. Wolves mark their territory with scats and urine to make a lasting impression on the area for anyone coming later. The scent lingers long after the howling fades. They can discern allies from enemies by the scent of the urine. This battle diary lets them know if the other wolves pass through this territory if they were male or female, and how recently they visited. A wolf marks its territory with his scent print around every 100 meters. Specialized glands around the anus and near the base of its tail produce his signature scent. A wolf's specialized sense of smell is 100,000 times more sensitive than ours. They exhale through side slits in their nostrils, so the incoming scent doesn't get diluted. Their olfactory bulb, which recognizes smells, is three times larger than in humans. When the mission calls for finding food, scent is crucial. The wolves sniff out a bison herd on the edge of their forest. They can detect their prey from almost three kilometers. Now they must target a single calf. The chase begins. Working together, the wolves herd the buffaloes. They come from all sides, trying to separate the little one from the rest. With their specialized sense of smell, some wolves don't need to see their prey. They can track it by scent until the very end. Such is the power of a wolf pack's incredible sensory talents and their tactical methods of communication that brings them success on the battlefield. Wolves succeed because of their pack mentality. The group is always stronger than the individual. Nowhere is this more true than with our next Special Forces Specialists. Their dedication to a common goal is among the strongest in the animal kingdom. From the moment they're born, these soldiers are enlisted, assigned a rank, and begin their service. 
The world's airspace is the domain of all kinds of insects. This particular Air Force patrols all but the coldest regions of the globe. Carefully attending to the local flora, honeybees. Honeybees embody the idea of hive intelligence. The hive operates like a single living organism. To make it work, everyone's a specialist with a specific job to perform. A hive could have 30,000 or more crew members. Sterile female workers collect pollen to feed the colony. Male drones stay near the hive to protect it and build a new honeycomb. It's a tightly run operation, as disciplined as any military unit. But what goes on behind the scenes to keep the hive humming? These tiny pilots rely on two systems to perform their duties. Pheromones that they pick up with their antennae and polarized light from the sun. The pheromones are like orders that come directly from the general, in this case, the hive's only queen. She alone lays the eggs, up to 2,000 a day. The queen's most important pheromones reassure the hive that she's okay, so they won't produce another queen. Other pheromones prevent the workers from laying eggs of their own. Her pheromones keep her in charge. They also keep the hive running smoothly, so everyone knows his or her specialized role in the feeding and protection of the colony. Among these specialists live super specialists. Heater bees flap their wing muscles to raise the temperature in the hive. Not only do they keep the hive warm, but by controlling the temperature of the eggs, they can determine which of the workers will become foragers and which will become housekeepers. They keep crucial hive operations in balance. Every bee performs its duty perfectly because it's the job he or she was born to do. Every day, foraging worker bees fly reconnaissance missions to collect nectar and pollen. They may travel as far as 15 kilometers from the hive. Working on the front lines, they're lucky to live a month. On average, these workers will visit up to 500 million flowers in a season. They navigate by reading polarized light on sunny days and on cloudy days, ultraviolet light. But what is even more amazing is the way they convey their military intelligence to the other troops when they return to the hive. They reveal the coordinates of the pollen source by doing a waggle dance. The waggle tells the squadron the distance to the food source. The longer the waggle, the further the source. Then there's angle. It shows where the target is in relation to the sun. Even when the sun moves as the day progresses, the bee's internal clock tells her the correct position. By this amazingly accurate technique, she can guide the others to food sources up to six kilometers away, ensuring the hive won't go hungry. Moving on to Africa, where the most ferocious of bees live, a hive is under siege. Elephants will tear down trees to eat the tender leaves, but this tree has a beehive. The entire colony could be wiped out. The soldiers go to DEFCON 2. Pheromones spread the alert. Everyone reports to battle stations. Every time they sting the elephant, they leave traces of pheromone that attracts more bees to the spot. 
That's a lot of painful stings, especially to the soft skin. The bee's swift response repels the enemy. A great victory for the small bees using the power of scent to protect their nation. Bees use their specialist powers to build and expand, but they keep to themselves. Others use the same powers to stage huge invasions, cutting a swath of destruction in their path. The arrival of seasonal rains brings a shot of life across the landscape after a prolonged drought. This new green world can also awaken a ravenous sleeper cell. In African, American, and Australian arid zones, when conditions are right, a demolition team starts to gather, seemingly out of nowhere. They begin their long, hungry march across the grassland. They look strangely familiar. You've seen them or their relatives around, but hopefully never like this. Invading in force, here come the locusts. Swarms of desert locusts can span several hundred square kilometers. At about 50 million locusts per square kilometer, we're talking an invasion of tens of thousands of millions of voracious infantry. They navigate to the next battlefield by detecting polarized light. As they grow into adults, they molt, and each time they do, their sensory equipment and appetites improve. At this early stage in their campaign, they follow the smell of fresh, sprouting grass. It's been said that an army marches on its stomach. That's true for locusts. Five weeks of constant eating mobilizes the infantry. Each soldier munches the equivalent of its body weight every day. Once they reach adulthood, these special forces improve their battle readiness. The locust infantry goes airborne. As winged adults, they aren't stopped by obstacles, so they can increase their destructive power. These adults release pheromones, signaling others in their swarm to join them in their search for new, fresh feeding grounds. Though desert locusts mostly use wind to travel great distances, they also read polarized sunlight. Each compound eye consists of around 9,000 optical sensors called omatidia. About 400 of them are calibrated to detect polarized light. Besides orienting the swarm, the light helps them avoid large bodies of water so they don't risk drowning. By following the wind, they always head to areas with low pressure, which means rain and fresh vegetation. They'll keep consuming crops until all that's left is the barren desert.
At the end of the season, they'll die, but a new generation will arise from eggs they've laid. The conditions in which they hatch will determine whether they live solitary lives or will once again assemble an army. It seems that five senses would be enough, but nature proves over and over again that they're not. And even among some specialists, the basic five get stretched to the limit. Take barn swallows. They migrate thousands of miles by relying not on sight or sound or smell, but by sensing the planet's magnetic field above and below the equator. Bottlenose dolphins rely on hearing, but in a high-frequency, highly unconventional way. They use echolocation like sonar to find their meals and other sounds to find pod mates. Rhinos also use sound, but where dolphins hear high notes, rhinos are specialists at transmitting low infrasound, like a secret message to a friendly agent. While rhinos are transmitters, stingrays are receivers. They use a sixth sense to pick up minute electrical signals from their prey. When the water's a conductor, resistance is futile. A wolf hunts more traditionally, relying on his remarkable sense of smell. To a wolf, the wilderness must be a kaleidoscope of ever-changing scents for him and his pack to explore and exploit. Like wolves, meerkats use sight and scent, but mainly to avoid predators. And similar to wolves, they rely on teamwork. Bees live in a different world of chemical signals in the pheromones that dictate their behavior. And to navigate, these special forces trust their eyes, not with anything we can see but by reading polarized light. It's a specialized skill bees share with locusts. When these field workers unite and revolt, cutting a swath across the land, polarized light steers them clear of wide water. These are the specialists, the special forces who have mastered their particular place in the world.